Great. Great. Here's hoping this is all working. Because honestly, I don't know. I don't know if it's working. If you're here, say something. Please, in the chat. <laughs> so I know that everything is good and working and on. Uh, this is my first time doing one of these lives. So welcome. Thank you for being here, everyone. Um, all right. So the big question of today, what makes a fast lyric more or less singable in musical theater? We all know that there are certain songs that have um, fast condensed lyrics, often called patter songs in musical theater. Um, but some are famously more singable than others. And the big question here today is why? Why is that true? As writers, we need to make sure that we are providing singers with something that feels relatively natural and easy and flowing, uh, feels doable, and doesn't require them to um, fix our writing. You don't want to come across as that writer. I know that I don't want to come across as that writer, and hopefully you don't either. Um, plus, if the lyric is hard to sing, then it's going to be a lot less clear for the audience as to what is going on. And understandability, clarity is key to musical theater writing and performing both. So that's always our main goal. So today we're gonna to look at a few examples from the musical theater canon and chat about what makes a fast lyric more or less singable when words are dense and they are flying fast. So yeah, that's today's chat. Uh, if you uh, don't know me, hi, hello, I'm Michael Ratty. I am also known as Musical Theater Writer Guy here on the YouTubes. Um, basically, what I talk about on this channel is all about musical theater from a storytelling perspective. So mostly geared toward writers, but of course, we, we chat with other people in the industry as well, especially performers, because I'm also a vocal coach as well. And I am the founder of Musical Theater Writing Collective, which is an online community for musical theater writers, where, well, online purely for now, but hoping to be hybrid as we grow. Um, and inside the collective, if you are a writer, you can come on in and have access to all the resources. And we have bi-weekly labs and all sorts of fun things where you get to interact with people. And if you are a collaborator of writers, like a performer, director, designer, then you can also be a member. Um, and you don't need the full function, so it's less. Uh, but yeah, that way we can all come together and create some musical theater together. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And just so you know, Y'all, yeah, this is this is the first of these live streams. So if there are hiccups along the way, I apologize. We'll see how it goes. As my creative mentors like to say, it's all an experiment. So here we go. If you're joining me on the replay, hello, welcome. Here we are. Um, all right, so live streams. Just a quick note about this. We are going to be doing these every other week, probably at this time, 11 a.m. Eastern. And uh, we're going to talk about a topic or maybe to analyze some songs or I don't know. I will let the audience guide the conversation. I have plenty of topics I can talk about, but I want to make sure that these are fun and interesting for all of you as well. So if there are things you'd like to uh, have me talk about or do in these live streams, let me know. Um, Great. So the way that these are going to work is we're going to talk about a topic. I will tell you about some stuff that I have coming up in case you're interested. And then uh, at the end, if there's time, uh, we won't run over an hour with these. If there is time, though, I can kind of open it to an ask me anything portion if you are around live with me and have any questions. So please feel free to utilize the chat as we go through. OK, so why this topic and why today? A member of the Musical Theater Writing Collective, hey Stephanie, had asked me, I think last week, about a very specific song and its singability, which we will talk about later on today. And it got me thinking about these types of songs and when they land well and when they don't. And what's the difference? Because when they don't land well, it's a problem for the performers and for the audience. On the performer side, if there is a song that is written in a way that doesn't naturally fall and land, it is so much more work, not only to learn it, but then to do it, to make sure that the audience is getting everything that they need. And for the audience, 
if they are watching a show where the performer is not quite making that work happen, not quite fixing everything, well, then it's a lot harder to understand the character, the story, the intentions, and then what are we all doing? Why are we all in this space if we're not able to tell that story well and succinctly? So, we need to avoid issues. All right, let's talk about singability on the whole for a second. Singability ultimately comes down to how naturally the words, the emphasis, and the intentions fall with the lyric as it sits on the music, okay? So again, that's about how the words with their emphasis and their intentions fall on the music. So we could absolutely just talk about scansion for a hot sec here, right? The way that a word scans with the music, we want it to be, to feel natural for the way that that character would speak. Bearing in mind, writers, because I see this sometimes, that sometimes your character speaks differently than you do. So the way that you might say a word may not be the same way that your character might say a word. Uh, as a slight example, I did have to school myself on this when I was writing The King's Legacy because they are British. And I mean, I'm not using Renaissance British English language, but I'm using RP language uh, in emphasis. So I had to think about that when I was writing some of the songs. And occasionally I found some moments where I was like, oh, that is an American emphasis, not a British emphasis. So it is something that you do always have to bear in mind. And when it comes to having the emphasis fall naturally, what we're talking about is the stressed syllables and the unstressed syllables, right? Stressed, unstressed. So syllable, right? What part of the word naturally gets the emphasis? The primary emphasis, and sometimes there's also a secondary emphasis or a tertiary emphasis, depending on how long the word is, right? I mean, what was the longest word in the English language? Anti-disestablishmentarianism. That's got a lot of emphases in there, right? But no matter what, you want to make sure that the emphases of the word, and therefore the phrases and the full sentences, fit naturally as we would say it. Now, of course, we're also writing music, and sometimes we want to hold notes for melodic purposes, but we want to make sure there's always clarity here. Always clarity. We're always in service of clarity. Great. And then uh, we can also talk about rhyme. Rhyme is something else that comes into play here when we're talking about clarity. Because rhymes can help anchor the ear of the audience, not only to what's important, but generally to the line itself, to the melody. When a word falls in one way at the end of a line, our ears pick up on the fact that that might actually end up being some sort of rhyme, right? And we will be listening to it, or for it, I should say. And if the next line comes around and it lands similarly and there's no rhyme there, then the audience begins to wonder, why wasn't there a rhyme there? I thought there was going to be a rhyme. And then you've lost them, right? So that's one way that rhyme can come into this uh, equation. But more specifically, when it comes to these fast songs, patter songs, rhyming gets harder, not only to write, but also because you don't want the rhyme to distract from the rest of the words, period. If, if there's a moment in the fast lyric where the audience goes, oh, that was such a clever rhyme, right? And the moment they have that thought, they're not with you on the next line. It gets lost. So this makes rhyming really difficult in these songs because you want to make sure that you are serving the story and not distracting the audience. That's hard to do. But the major thing that I see kind of fall to the wayside when people are writing these songs is what the intentions of the uh, character are in this moment because that's ultimately what the performers are going to be acting out, is the intentions. So even if the words fall naturally, if intention changes in the middle of a line and it doesn't feel like the music has changed phrasing at all, then it, it might get lost that transition and the actor has to do a lot of work to make it clear like, this is, this is one thought, but this is a new thought, right? Not that actors can't do that work, I mean, part of their job. But we don't want to overly complicate things if we can avoid it. 
So those are my words of warning there as far as it goes uh, with uh, scansion, rhyme, and intentions. But we will look at some examples and we'll, we'll do some stuff and we'll be great. Um, looking at my notes here. Oh, yes. So Stephen Sondheim, I think it's pretty much the master in the musical theater canon as far as writing pattery songs that uh, scan well, where the rhyme does not become distracting and where the intentions are clear. Uh, I mean, he's kind of the lyrical master of musical theater in general, in my opinion. But I think in particular with this topic, he's probably the one who's written the majority of them and he does them very well. Hmm. So famously, he's been called a very singable writer. Performers really enjoy singing his stuff because words fit naturally and they don't have to do too much work with the words and the melody to make it happen. Most of their work can be, you know, performance work, acting work, intention work, the good stuff. Um, now, I will also say his music is also quite difficult at times. Sometimes his lyrics are even difficult at times, but dude wrote a lot of shows, so like, I'm willing to give him a break. Uh, but the reason I'm bringing up Stephen Sondheim is because the first example I want to look at today is uh, for anyone who has spent any time with me on this channel or in the collective, my ye old example of getting married today from company. Oh, you know what I'm realizing? Is that I should put on my original sound. Mm. Great, hopefully that works with the live streaming to YouTube. Let me know if it does or it doesn't. Use the chat, the comments, do your thing. All right, <clears throat> so we're gonna dive in to a wee bit of the fast material in Getting Married Today. If you are not familiar with this song, basically what is happening in this scene is that the character Amy is having a little bit of a nervous breakdown before going to get married, like it is the wedding day, they're about to go to the church and do the thing. And so she sings a patter song. I'm going to do a little bit of this here, so everybody's familiar, then we're going to chat a little bit about it and why it works, and where there are some things that uh, performers still need to work with. Okay. I cannot play this for real, so pardon me, internet. <clears throat> so we have, pardon me, is everybody there? Because if everybody's there, I want to thank you all for coming to the wedding. I'd appreciate your going even more. I mean, you must have lots of better things to do. Not a word of it to Paul. Remember, Paul, you know the man I'm gonna marry, but I'm not because I wouldn't ruin anyone's wonderful seeds. But I thank you all for the gifts and the flowers. Thank you all, now it's back to the showers. Don't tell Paul, but I'm not getting married today. Good morning, voice. Hello. The allergens are getting to me here in New York. I'm sure you all feel similarly wherever you are. If it's springtime. If you're in a different hemisphere and it's fall, I don't know what your life is like for allergens. Okay, so I was trying to do that with just focusing on the words and not giving any acting intention. I'm going to do it again, standing here so you can see me. Pardon me, is everybody there? Because if everybody's there, I want to thank you all for coming to the wedding. I'd appreciate your going even more. I mean, you must have lots of better things to do. And not a word of it to Paul. Remember, Paul, you know the man I'm going to marry, but I'm not because I wouldn't ruin anyone as wonderful as he is. But I thank you all for the gifts and the flowers. Thank you all. Now it's back to the showers. Don't tell Paul, but I'm not getting married today. Great. Can you understand the words? Yes. Do they fall naturally? Yes. But if I just sang it like that as a performer, without adding any of the acting intention in, it would be work for the audience to listen in to what is happening, right? And not that the audience can't do work. I mean, they chose to come to a show to engage, so they should be doing some work. But we don't want them to be straining to figure out what the heck is happening. Here's where the whole idea of intention comes in. Okay, because in terms of scansion, 
Pardon me is everybody there because if everybody's there, I want to thank you all for coming to the wedding. I'd appreciate your going even more. I mean, you must have lots of better things to do and not a word of it to Paul. Remember, Paul, you know the man I'm gonna marry, but I'm not because I wouldn't ruin anyone as wonderful as he is, but I think fits perfectly, right? da 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 We're working with that. And even though some of these words are single syllable, some of them are multiple multiple syllables with the emphasis on the first. Some of them are multiple syllables with the emphasis on the second and or fourth, right? There are different uh, stresses of the words themselves, but the way they fall on the scheme, the rhythm scheme there is da 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 and it fits perfectly. It's wonderful, wonderful. You'll also notice that section has no rhyme in it at all. In fact, we don't do any rhyming until thank you all for the gifts and the flowers. Thank you all. Now it's back to the showers. Don't tell Paul, but I'm not getting married today. Right? We have the rhyme on the two alls into Paul, as well as flowers and showers. So, why did we hold off on rhyme for the fast stuff? Well, this song goes very, very fast. <laughs> I was not doing it up to tempo. And the rhyme would be distracting. Or at least that's the call that Sondheim seemed to have made. Or maybe he decided that because she's having a mental breakdown, she would not have enough wherewithal to have thoughts that rhyme. No matter what his thought there was, the, the lack of rhyme helps. It really helps. If there were moments where we were really trying to anchor like da ba da ba da ba da ba da ba da ba da like if they were trying to mirror each other or be parallel in some way, reflect across, then having rhyming moments may land that idea. But this is just stream of consciousness. We're just going, right? And yes, there there's a melody. I rarely see this performed where the melody is stuck to. Most of the time it ends up being more of a, a spoken kind of rant with inflection. But... Uh, if that was more important, then rhyme, sure, could definitely come in and help anchor us in our ears. But that's not the case here. So here we are. So talk about intention for a moment, Michael. Yes, I will. Thank you. So we have, pardon me, is everybody there? That's the first actual, like, sentence. Pardon me, is everybody there? But that's not the end of the idea, right? Because if everybody's there, I want to thank you all, uh... I want to thank you all for coming to the wedding, right? That whole thing. Pardon me, is everybody there? Because if everybody's there, I want to thank you all for coming to the wedding. That is the first idea here. The only thing that the performer really needs to add in to make clear that there are two sentences is hitting the word because, right? That's a pretty easy thing to do. Pardon me, is everybody there? Because if everybody's there, I want to thank you all for coming to the wedding. Thank you all for coming to the wedding, right? Those things need emphasis because it's the setup for the thing. Great. That's a performer's normal job, is to do that kind of work. They can do that, no problem. Then we have a shift to the next beat. I'd appreciate your going even more. I mean, you must have lots of better things to do, and not a word of it to Paul. Okay. There's actually two things in there, even though that is the next sentence. Two things with a little aside moment. So, I'd appreciate your going even more. That's our new thought. I mean you must have lots of better things to do, is the turn on that thought, and then a new mini thought, and not a word of it to Paul, right? Now, not only are we saying that we want to have you not all be here, but don't tell Paul, which is something we repeat throughout the entire show. Or, excuse me, throughout the entire song. Ha, <laughs> not the whole show. My goodness. So, I'd appreciate your going even more. I mean, you must have lots of better things to do, and not a word of it to Paul. Right, there's going to have to be a renewal of energy and intention on each of those little turns and new thoughts. Still doable, right? Remember, Paul, <laughs> which is technically a continuation of the same thought from before, right? And not a word of it to Paul. Remember, Paul? But we're going to continue with that thought even further. You know the man I'm going to marry, but I'm not because I wouldn't ruin anyone as wonderful as he is. Right? So now we have this, and not a word of it to Paul. 
Remember Paul, you know the man I'm gonna marry. But I'm not because I wouldn't ruin anyone as wonderful as he is. Again, just a little bit about energy and emphasis. And then the intentions are clear. And because the words are already fitting so naturally on this music, it's very singable. Don't get me wrong, it's hard to do fast, but it's very singable. So if we were to do that all with intention behind it, it should pop. My apologies for turning around to play, y'all. I don't know, I gotta figure out like a two camera setup somehow. Maybe get like a better streaming service, I don't know. We'll figure it out. If y'all have ideas or recommendations, put them in the chat or comments. <clears throat> Wish me luck. Pardon me as everybody there. Because if everybody's there, I want to thank you for coming to the wedding. I'd appreciate your going even more. I mean, you must have lots of better things to do. Not a word of it to Paul. Remember, Paul, you know the man I'm going to marry, but I'm not. Because I wouldn't ruin anyone's wonderful scenes. But I thank you all for the gifts and the flowers. Thank you all. Now it's back to the showers. Don't tell Paul, but I'm not getting married today. I know that wasn't perfect, but this isn't about me as a performer today. Even though it's that fast, we can use that intention, that emphasis as performers to, to make sure that what we're saying is crystal clear. Does the audience have to listen in? Yes, absolutely. But that's work that they're here to do. The intention work is stuff that the performers are here to do. So the writer did their job and everyone else is doing their job and it's a grand old time. Now, is this song absolutely perfect the entire time? No. I think it's pretty darn close. But there are a couple moments later on where they're a bit harder. I've taught this song to a lot of performers, and there are sections that are tough. Why? Great question, Dane, for asking. The, it, it's less about the logical intention of what's happening and more about... Consonants. Consonants get in the way in the song a lot because it needs to be crisp enough that we understand what's happening, but also we don't want to overdo the consonants here or it muddies the actual sound. So uh, here's a moment in the second verse. Listen, everybody, look, I don't know what you're waiting for. A wedding, what's a wedding? It's a prehistoric ritual where everybody promises. Right there. It's a prehistoric ritual where everybody promises. The H being in the middle there, prehistoric, steals a little bit of breath away, which is tough. And then you've got this RW thing back and forth. Wedding, what's a wedding? It's a prehistoric ritual where everybody promises. And that's tough for a lot of people, R to W, going back and forth quickly. So that's a moment that's a little tough. Uh, I think that's the only one in this section. Which maybe this one, my father behind or something. Yep, that's the only one in this one. Um, and the third one here, <laughs> I love this section, but it's tough. Listen, everybody, look, I'm afraid. You, ooh, listen, everybody, I'm afraid you didn't hear, or do you want to see a crazy lady fall apart in front of you? It isn't only Paul who may be ruining his life, you know, we'll both of us be losing our identities. I telephoned my analyst about it, and he said to see him Monday, but by Monday, I'll be floating in the Hudson with the other garbage. I'm not wet. So what makes that one tough? It isn't only Paul who may be ruining his life. You know, we both of us will, wheel, wheel, not we, but wheel. That's a tough one to sneak in there. It isn't only Paul who may be ruining his life. You know, will both of us be losing our identities? I telephoned my analyst about it. That identities into I telephone is also where people tend to sneak in a breath, which is tough as well. Um, the other thing that makes this one hard as a verse is the fast words go all the way to the end of this melody. Floating in the Hudson with the other garbage. I'm not well, so I'm not getting married. And there's no, so there's no lead-in into the I'm not well. Garbage into I. That's another tough thing to do. But it makes for a great acting moment for people because you have to like gasp for air a little bit. <laughs> you can use that, it's fun. And then the last thing that makes it tough is the list in verse four. Hmm, can I sing this one? Look, I didn't want to have to tell you, but I may be coming down with hepatitis and I think I'm going to faint. So if you want to see me faint, I'll do it happily. But wouldn't it be funnier to go and watch a funeral? So thank you for the 27 dinner plates and 37 butter knives and 47 paperweights and 57 candle holders. I'm not well. The choice of blank T7 is great because it's specific and pretty easy to do. It's when you add the first bit. 27 dinner plates and 37 butter knives and 47 paperweights and 57 candle holders. 
it's not that it's not doable. It does take a little extra work, though, on the performer's part. But it's good. It's fun. So, this is a good example of how it's done well. Um, I'd like to look at an example, a song example, that does, um, does some really great work and then has a couple moments where it took me a long time to know what was being said. I'm going to pull out some music here. Am I? Yes, there it is. Okay. All right. So there's a song in this little show called Rent. I'm sure you've never heard of it. It's very, um, downtown. All right. It's called La Vie Bohème. It's a lovely part of song. Great. Oh, this version's terrible to look at. Who put this together? I don't even know. I'm going to look at a different version. So, if you're familiar with Rent at all, this is the uh, end of Act 1, and it is a raucous and glorious time, and it is led by... Mark, who has this fantastic patter opening, and then that music gets passed off to other people as well. Now, Mark's opening that is fast on this is great. It's really well written. It feels like it flows pretty naturally. But later on, when it gets passed off, and it's literally being passed between different voices, that's where it sometimes gets a bit muddy. Well, we'll take a look here. So we're going to skip the delightful actual opening of the thing. Dearly beloved, we gather here to say our goodbyes. That one's fun. Okay. <clears throat> this is the key we're in? Great. I grew up on this show and I have to say y'all, that gets me going every time, it's so good. <laughs> the days of inspiration, playing hooky, making something out of nothing, the need to express, to communicate, to going against the grain, going insane, going mad, to love and tension, no pension, to more than one dimension, to starving for attention, hating convention, hating pretension, not to mention of course, hating dear old mom and Dad, to riding your bike midday past the three pea suit, to fruit, to no absolute, to absolute, to choice, to the village voice, to any passing fad, to being an us for once, instead of a them, la vie bohème. I did not warm up, my apologies, y'all. But that right there. You without any acting involved, boy, does that work. Part of it is because of how well it scans. Absolutely, it's a great bit of scansion. Secondarily, that melody really helps sell some of these ideas. Now that's something that Sunday wasn't really as concerned with in getting married today as far as we can tell. Here though, the major and minor movements of the melody seem to really add some subtext to what is being said, right? It adds to the intention for the performers. I love that. That's fantastic. As a performer, that's a great clue to me. Even if I had never heard the song and I'm just learning for the first time, which, what rock have I been living under? But if I'm coming in for the first time, blank slate. That tells me so much. So, for instance... Um, where is a good back and forth? To loving tension, no pension, to more than one dimension, to starving for attention, hating convention, hating pretension, not to mention, of course. That back and forth, sure, is it just like jazzy and fun? Absolutely. But, on top of that, to loving tension, no pension, then we're gonna go a little kookier. The more than one I mentioned, to starving for attention, hating convention, hating pretension. That means something a little extra to this guy, I assume. Not to mention, of course, 
back to the normal thing, hating dear old mom and dad, which is of course so normal that it does not deserve to be made a C flat, but instead a C. Right? Just those little moments tell you how Mark feels about, well, doesn't like give you, this is the emotion that Mark feels, but it tells you that Mark feels a little extra way about some of these things, right? So that's super useful. Um, great, great. And then on top of all that, we do have some internal rhymes here. We have some lovely rhymes, which really help, and some end rhymes that help. So, to days of inspiration playing hooky, making something out of nothing, that need to express to communicate. Nothing. Great. We're just getting started, right? That's a great way to just start us off. To going against the grain, going insane, going mad. Ooh, that's a little more fun, right? That mad is not rhyming with something that's coming before, though it's the end of a mini section here. But we've got going against the grain, going insane, right? And unlike the other song, Getting Married, which it, uh, is a constant patter, this has some variation in the rhythms, which is fun. And that helps here. Going against the grain, going insane. Ba -da 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 more flexibility. To loving tension, no pension. To more than one dimension. To starving for attention hating, convention hating, pretension. Not to mention, of course. You know? That's really good. <laughs> I love that there are seven rhymes in there across that little section. And it, like, it follows, the logic here follows, loving tension, no pension, to more than one dimension, right? We're going from something that's very normal into something a little stranger, to starving for attention, hating convention, hating pretension. These things all go together very well. Not to mention, of course, little palate cleanser, hating dear old mom and dad. So well done. To riding your bike midday past the three-piece suits, to fruits, to no absolute, uh, to no absolute, excuse me. Um, so this three-piece suits, fruits, no absolutes, which leads us in to absolute, to choice, to the village voice. So well done. To any passing fad. And this fad land in something that feels like a rhyme? Yeah, back with mom and dad, and also back with mad, right? It's really well put together in a way that even though this song flies, and there's so much going on on stage, like if you've ever seen a production of Rent, especially anything that's even remotely based off of the original staging of Rent, there's a lot happening. It gets a little bit chaotic, which is part of the fun of the song. But this really helps us stay uh, grounded with the vocal, so we understand what's being said. And it's great! Okay. That is me. Discussion about rent. Now, where does it get a little bit harder? Great question. Thank you for asking. To handcrafted beers made in local breweries. To yo, got to yogurt, to rice and beans and cheese. To leather, to... Um, well, am I going to get a cover or am I going to strike for that? I don't know. We'll work with it. To leather, to dill, those to curry in the loo, to hueros, rancheros, and Maya Angelou, emotion, devotion, to causing a commotion, creation, vacation, mucho masturbation, compassion, to fashion, to passion when it's new, to Sontag, to Sondheim, to anything taboo. <sighs> okay, so the opening of that. To handcrafted beers made in local breweries. That's our first major misstress to the fast material. Breweries is not how we say that word. We say breweries, right? Passable. We understand. And there's a rest afterwards. We got it. To yoga, to yogurt. I understand why we're stressing the yos, because the yos is what connects these things together in terms of ideas. But yoga and yogurt, the ga and the gurt fly. So it's a little hard to hear the first time. If you're not familiar with this song, the first time you hear that, it may pass you by. To yoga, to yogurt, to rice and beans and cheese. The next one that's hard to hear, well, actually, because after that point, then it gets actually very easy to hear for, for the next section until we get to compassion, to fashion, to passion when it's new. 
the way it's written in here is actually interesting. I haven't looked at the original score in a while. We have to passion, to passion when it's new. Passion when it's new. That's not how we would emphasize that, right? Um, compassion to fashion to passion when <laughs> to passion when it's new. Yeah, trying to do it as written is actually hard. I see why they, why that's not how it is on the original recording. So that's something that's uh, a little mistressed and hard to hear, even when it's done well. Passion when it's new. <laughs> to Sontag to Sondheim. Again, we have that yoga yogurt trap. Sontag, Sontag and Sondheim. Yeah, I see why we're connecting these things, both orally and in terms of ideas, but it's hard to understand, as it flies. Um, so, again, I'm not saying that this is a bad pattern by any means. It's great, actually. Uh, there's a lot of ideas in here, and they go very quickly, and you can hear most of it very well. But as someone who grew up on Rent, listening to this album over and over and over, there were always times. Where I had to pull out that that little lyric book. Do you guys remember the little lyric book that used to come in the CD cases? I kind of miss that. Like, why don't when we're selling albums, why don't we have the little insert anymore? Even if it's a digital insert, you know, I want to look at lyrics sometimes. Anyway, so I would often have to pull that out and follow along and be like, wait a second. Uh, now, also, I was I was a bit young, so some of these things made no sense to me anyway. Like, I didn't know who Sontag or Sondheim were at the age of, I don't know. But even so, I wanted to know what all the words were, and some of them were very hard to hear. Obviously, it's different live in a theater, but um, it was always helpful to have that reference nearby for the words that were harder to hear. Great. Great. So that's a little bit about rent. Well, a lot of people went. Not that there isn't other pattern, there is. But we're not going to hit on that today. Uh, by the way, if this is something you're enjoying, uh, <laughs> we have nerdy conversations like this all the time in the collective, uh, whether that's during our labs. So we do labs bi-weekly. I should explain what labs are. Labs are every other week, and the time varies, because uh, we have people in the collective from all over the world trying to make it as uh, accessible as possible to everybody. But what we do during labs is we have a sign-up form where people can sign up to do a share, uh, whether that's a song share or a share of a piece of work, like from a show they're writing, could be a dialogue scene sort of thing, or sometimes even just like, I've got this thing, this idea, this roadblock, can I just talk it through with people? And you can sign up for a 25 minute share and we have a feedback process where, where essentially you tell us what your goals are, you share the piece, we affirm what's working very well, and then we go and um, based off of what you're saying is what you need, we try to give that to you. So it's very writer focused, It's they're super helpful and they're lovely and they're warm. So that's one part of what we do during labs. And then sometimes we uh, just, sit around and chat, which is really nice, and <laughs> they do often devolve into nerdy conversations like this one today. So if this is something that is of any interest to you, hey, come join us. We're, we're delightful. I'm not going to lie. And then also, sometimes during lab, we have the option to um, do silent writing, just accountability writing, which uh, is really nice to have like other people working right here that you can see while you're also working. Because in those moments when I look up and I'm like, I don't wanna do this anymore. And then I see other people working, I'm like, I'm gonna keep doing the thing, right? It's great. Um, and of course we have other programs and things, but the labs are included in the membership. It's, if you are any tier of member, you can come to labs. They're wonderful, they're wonderful. Um, if you want to go for a deeper dive into some of these topics, you should uh, take a look at the flagship course, the flagship musical theater writing workshop course. So this is a cohort course that I teach twice per year. Uh, we are in the, almost in the middle of cohort three right now. Cohort four starts uh, at the end of summer. I don't have the date set yet, but it'll be the end of August most likely will be the first course date. And that will go through the fall and through January. And that course is kind of giving you all of the fundamentals of musical theater writing 
there is a focus in terms of the practical work on songwriting, but the course itself goes far beyond songwriting. I mean, our, we, we talk about, uh, of course, song forms, as well as how to write songs, rhyme, scansion, all the fun stuff. But then we go beyond that. We talk about show structures. We talk about show development. We talk about musical development, creating a musical world, uh, collaboration. We talk about all sorts of things that are necessary. But I also build in time into the last like third of curriculum of the course to really focus on the questions, thoughts, needs um, of each individual cohort. Because every group, <clears throat> pardon me, every group has their own thoughts, feelings, and questions, right? So I want to structure time for all of you who are taking the course. But the practical side of the work is songwriting. We do six songwriting challenges throughout our time together, uh, and you will end up doing nine, nine? nine song shares during our time together. So something is due every two weeks. So we are going and it keeps you on your toes and it's delightful and we write all sorts of different things. Our first three songs are uh, different song forms that we try out and then um, our latter three songs, each of which has a rewrite attached, that's why it's nine song shares, uh, those are based in like types of songs that you need in your shows. Um, it's a lot of fun and you get to collaborate with people. We switch up the pairs on who is writing together so you get to experience not only collaboration but collaboration with new people who perhaps you've never met before which is really lovely. And then like I said we do a lot of just nerdy talking. Like I build a curriculum but it's not, it's not a lecture sort of course. It's more of a discussion course so people ask questions or they <laughs> may want to uh, disagree with me on a point, which is great. I love that because then it opens up that conversation. Uh, I will often just be like flying through my scores looking for things to, to add new examples in that I hadn't planned to use. It's a lot of fun. We have a great time. So if that's of interest to you at all, uh, even though the cohort doesn't start until August, applications are rolling at this point. So please feel free to fill out an application and... Let's schedule a chat. See what's up. See if it's right for you. Anywho, I should probably put, like pin a comment with that link. I'll do that. Yeah, I'll pin the comment later on. Hopefully I remember. Okay. Here we are! Um, I got on quite a tangent there. My apologies. Let's... Okay, so here's the, the song in question that sparked this whole conversation. Do, do, do. It is from Matilda. You know, I did not check ahead of time if I had the score. I think I did. I have to, right? Right? I worked on it. Not the brother. All uh, right. You know what? If I don't have it, I know where I do have it. Great. I do. Lovely. Okay. So. I'm sure we're all familiar with Matilda at this point. If you were not familiar with the stage version of the show, then I'm sure you saw the Netflix movie, which I thought was a great little adaptation. Uh, I, have, I haven't really had an in-depth discussion with anyone about this yet, but I thought that the way that they went through their... The way they went through the show and then they stripped things away and did a little bit of rearranging of the material to not only create a film version that made a lot of sense, but also told the story efficiently and also, <laughs> not for nothing, <laughs> could be filmed in COVID times. Uh, I thought it was a great adaptation. The... The one thing that I missed, and this is, just, this is just very personal, but the one thing I missed was the brother. There was just something about Matilda being the only child that altered that dynamic with the parents a little bit in a way that I questioned. But other than that, I thought it was great. Oh, also, uh, Revolting Children, which was fantastic way done. So well done. Uh, I kind of wanted that to lead into... The, the big climactic trench bowl moment instead of being like the after moment. But again, that's a me thing. If you agree, let me know. If you disagree, let me know. I'm curious. All right. So 
What is the song that we are talking about here? It is the song Quiet. So, if you're familiar with the show, then you'll know that this is toward the end of... I mean, it's really toward the end of everything. It's toward the end of the show. This is a moment where Matilda is gaining her powers and talking about what it feels like in the moment before. And it's fast. It's tough. Okay. By the way, don't forget, I, I if you have questions, like if they ask me anything questions, we'll do that too after we talk about this example. If there's time. I think there will be some time. It's like, what, quarter off? We're good. All right. Haven't looked at this in a hot sec. <clears throat> Whoops. So we have here, have you ever wondered, will I have about how when I say say red, for example, there's no way of knowing if red means the same thing in your head as red means in my head when someone says red, and how if we are traveling at almost the speed of light, and we're holding a light, that light would still travel away from us at the full speed of light, which seems right in a way, but I'm trying to say, not sure. Okay, I'm going to stop there for a moment. Obviously, I wasn't playing the, the accompaniment, but part of the reason I didn't want to play the accompaniment right there is because it gets kind of busy when it's just me and a voice, or <laughs> my hands and a voice. Um, already, you may have some questions, or may not have heard everything. There's a moment here where if you sing, here, I'll just do it. If you sing the thing as written, you begin to question some of the choices of scansion. Have you ever wondered well, I have about how when I say say red, for example, there's no way of knowing if red means the same thing in your head as red means in my head when someone says red. And how if we are traveling at almost the speed of light and we're holding the light, that light would still travel away from us at the full speed of light, which seems right in a way, but I'm trying to say. <sighs> you can kind of understand what's happening. <clears throat> but these intention switches are tough. They're very, very tough. And the words aren't falling exactly naturally. They're close. They're very close. But even this opening line, have you ever wondered? We don't say wondered. We say wondered, right? Have you ever wondered? Well, I have. About how when I say say red, for example. About how when I say say red. So we have when I say... And then say, as like an interjection, red. We understand that. We get it. But that is work for the performer to have to do to make sure that we get it because of the way it's written. For example, there's no way of knowing if there's no way of knowing if red means the same thing in your head as red means in my head when someone says red. That falls so much more naturally and lands the end of that phrase logically really well for us. But if you miss the first part of it, you may be wondering by the time we get there, why are we talking about the color red? And then we're on to something else, right? And how if we are traveling at almost the speed of light and we're holding a light, that light would still travel away from us at the full speed of light, which seems right in a way. Starts off great there, that thing about lights and speed of light. That light would still travel away from us. It feels clipped, that little moment. Like, we can hear it with some good performance, but it feels clipped at the full speed of light, which seems right in a way. That's fast. And then it's a throwaway anyway, right? At the full speed of light, which seems right in a way, but I'm trying to say, I'm not sure, but I wonder if inside my head, I'm not just a bit different from some of my friends. This is falling out a lot easier, right? The answers that come into my mind unbidden, these stories delivered to me fully written. And when everyone shouts like they seem to like shouting, that one's a hard one. Now. I will go ahead and just say at this point, I do have a little extra context here for my feelings and thoughts on this song, which is, I worked with, well, not that I don't still work with kids, I do occasionally, but I worked primarily with children for like a decade. During that time, Matilda came out. Not only were kids interested in singing Matilda material, 
which was great. Say that five times fast. So I worked a lot naughty and a lot of quiet. And revolting children. So not only did I do that, but then the licensing became available. So places all over the place were doing this show. People would come to me and they'd be like, I want this role. And then we'd be doing it. Professional productions, educational productions, all over the place. So I've worked this material a lot of times with a lot of kids. Let me tell you, getting young people to sing with something that feels natural, sounds healthy and good, and also is really well-intentioned as an actor, is hard to begin with. Don't get me wrong. The kids who want to do it, they make it happen. They will do the work, and it's great. It's fun. I love teaching kids. But also, this song always presented problems. Not because it's not doable, but it's just so unnatural in certain spots that they really had to dig in. And that was frustrating to young people. Not all young people, but a lot of young people get frustrated when they have to dig in and do work that feels like, why wasn't it just done for me? Which ultimately is the writer's job. Nothing against him mentioned here. I think the show is wonderful. I saw it three times on Broadway and I adore it. But there is, there are moments in the song where we could have done better as far as a fast, dense lyric. I will also say, for the Netflix film, they took the tempo down just a little bit. I don't know by how much, but it was a great choice. <laughs> and there were a lot of close-ups on her face, which is also a great choice. Gives the audience a lot better uh, chance at understanding everything as it flies by. Have you ever wondered, well I have, about how when I say, say red, for example, there's no way of knowing if red, like just that slight pull back and then imagine being close up on her face. Like, you'll get it. It's fine. It's great. But as written, it's a little tough for a stage. And especially when you're working with kids who are not professionals yet. So that's my kind of like mini diatribe, 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 um, about why this work is not only important, but especially important when you're working with children. Okay. Same thing kind of comes into play with revolting children as well. There are certain lines in that song that fly by so fast and are emphasized strangely enough that I didn't know what they were until I saw the music. I was like, oh, that's what they're saying? Neato. And like, they're good lines. They're clever lines. The logic follows. It's really good stuff. And I just want to make sure that I can hear it all as an audience member. So that is my answer to that question. This was fun. I really enjoy this sort of work. Anyway, so we are now at the point where uh, we've got like eight minutes left. If anyone has a question, we can do a little ask me anything. If no one has a question today, that's cool. And we can leave end the stream a little bit early. Um, but if you have thoughts, questions, things you would like me to do in these live streams in the future, whether that be like song analysis or talk about a specific topic, please let me know. Put it in the comments. Or come join the collective and you can message me directly and we can chat about it. That's how Stephanie actually started the conversation that led to this. Was she had direct messaged me this question and I thought it was an interesting one. But sure, let's do our first live stream about it. Um, I was going to say something else that's gone. Darn. Anywho. So, fast lyrics that are dense. We want clarity of not only the words, but the intentions. And you've got melody, you've got rhyme, you've got scansion, and then you've got your performers, right? So do make sure that you are taking care in the writing process to make this as accessible to the performers and the audience as possible. And I guarantee you that you will have a, um, a better shot <laughs> at being understood right from the get-go without too much extra work. And that's my dealio about that. So I don't see any questions coming in here, which means for today, we're just gonna end this early, which is nice. If you all joined me on the replay, I hope you uh, also leave comments. Please do, I, I will be very curious to know what's up. I will try to pin that comment with the links um, great. And in the meantime, 
If you have questions for me or want to join any programs, you know where to find me. All right, y'all. So thank you for joining here today or on whatever day you're watching this, and I'll see you again soon. All right, everybody. Cheers! Now I gotta figure out how to stop this live stream. You know, I definitely should have thought about that beforehand. Oh, look, there's a big red button. All right. Bye, everyone. Peace out.